very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so we are going to start our first online lecture uh, from Butterfly Conservation Society of Sri Lanka. And uh, before starting the lecture, uh, actually, I want to uh, remind you some very interesting uh, thing that we are celebrating our seventh anniversary of BCSSL in this year. And actually, we were uh, seven years back. Uh, we were started like gathering um, interesting people who is loving butterfly and we actually started it uh, in Colombo University we had our first committee meeting so actually uh, we have passed seven years and uh, when talking about our success as the uh, current president uh, I would like to tell that uh, we have already uh, done lots of programs, activities, and um, the number of members have increased, and also the volunteers and the success. We can measure the success. Actually, su success is not what you do, uh, what you talk, or what you show, but it is the effectiveness of your activity. So we have reached that. Uh, we have number of uh, programs and also we have number of people are gathering around those programs and they are helping us and frequent requests are coming to make the butterfly gardens and asking what are the plants that we can plan for attracting butterflies and those are the success we can see. Uh, so I'm really happy to be a founder member. And uh, in this moment, um, I like to invite uh, Mr. Himesh Jayasinghe, who is a founder president and uh, the first president, actually founder, and the first president of BCSSL to conduct the lecture for our seventh anniversary. So Himesh Ayer, can you share your screen yeah. with us? Can you see it now? So still we can't see the screen. Okay, now we can see your screen. Okay. Shall I start now? Yeah, uh, you can start now. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, today, we are going to talk about some uh, interesting uh, relationships between butterflies and plants. As you know, many of you know that butterflies are attracted to flowers and flowers are pollinated by butterflies. This is a general thing that you may know, but uh, here we can uh, discuss in mo more detail about uh, these interactions, uh, especially the butterflies uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, the the data that we gathered uh, during the previous years and uh, the the it is a very much interesting uh, things that we could we, we have found and some of them are going to be presented in this presentation so in this presentation uh, we are talking about uh, why the why the butterflies uh, need plants uh, not only for nectar uh, they uh, require uh, plants for so many other uh, requirements, as well as uh, uh, not all the plants are used by butterflies. There are certain uh, species of plants that are used by butterflies. Uh, we can uh, list out or check out what are those plant plants uh, the, that uh, butterflies are using. And uh, from these uh, relationships, both the butterflies and uh, plants uh, get benefits. So we'll uh, discuss on these matters. Another thing is that uh, in between uh, these uh, butterflies and plants, there are certain other uh, animals uh, or insects uh, come in between uh, these relationships. So we are going to talk those as well. And, uh, one other uh, thing is that uh, in uh, certain aspects, uh, some butterflies uh, do uh, some damages for plants. So uh, we can discuss uh, what are those damages and also uh, 
uh, what are the uh, things that uh, the plants has uh, taken off to minimize these damages so th that is the basic uh, things that we are going to uh, discuss in this uh, presentation uh, when when i am going to uh, when i am uh, conducting this presentation perhaps uh, you may found some questions and please uh, send those to us at, at the end of the uh, uh, presentation uh, i can explain those things okay so uh, actually the there are uh, so many uh, moths than uh, butterflies as you know actually the moths are the ones that we that uh, evolved earlier than butterflies uh, that means uh, butterflies are evolved from moths so uh, all the all all these uh, butterflies and moths are uh, called to the called under under the group uh, lepidoptera that has uh, scaly winged insects so uh, the special thing is that uh, sci uh, the scientists have found that the evolution of butterflies are uh, simultaneously happened with the evolution of uh, flowering plants so uh, there are certain uh, type of plants in the world so the flowering plants are the ones that have uh, flowers actually other than uh, the flowering plants there are so many uh, other species but uh, you may not notice them because uh, they are not blooming but the thing is that uh, as examples uh, you can see uh, so many ferns and uh, mosses those are the plants that are not uh, having flowers so the butterflies are not using those uh, plants mostly the butterflies are related with flowering plants so that's why the diverse diversification of uh, butterflies are was happened simultaneously with uh, flowering plants actually uh, uh, earliest fossils of butterfly is known to uh, present is uh, about 40 to 50 million years ago uh butterfly fossil is a very delicate structure so it is very much uh, rare to find those uh, fossils uh, than uh, other big creatures uh, so the scientists thinks that uh, they have evolved since uh, 145 years million years ago uh, together with the flowering plants so uh when we uh, take sri lanka you can see that uh, there is a, a lot of uh, relationship between the distribution of butterflies and plants because uh, actually uh, certain butterflies are restricted to certain areas depending on the uh, uh, microhabitat conditions of those uh, related plants especially uh, we will talk in detail uh, there's a there's a certain type group of plants called larval food plants so larval food plant is the major thing that uh, determine the distribution of butterflies so in the in in the other way the this for the distribution of plants in sri lanka uh, mainly the rainfall and temperature has uh, uh, done a very major impact on it. so uh, the thing is uh, the rainfall and temperature eventually uh, relates to the uh, distribution of butterflies of sri lanka so in this map you can see there are uh, 14 uh, colored uh, sections this is the uh, updated touristic zone map of sri lanka you can see the western side has so many colored uh, sections and uh, northern and eastern side as a, a single uh, section actually uh, in sri lanka most of the uh, floristic uh, studies have been have done uh, within the uh, wet zone you, i i mean the western side so it has a very detailed uh, uh, data so depending on that data uh, that has been split into 
several uh, sections but uh, in the dry zone uh, it is i think uh, there are certain uh, unique uh, uh, floristic areas so it is better to do more surveys and studies and uh, to uh, identify those specific conditions in the dry zone as well so uh, this is the type of uh, uh, floristic uh, pattern in sri lanka and now uh, let's go to the uh, 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 limiting factor uh, data of this uh, uh, floristic zone so uh, this is the climatic zones of sri lanka uh, basically the southwestern area uh, that is the most uh, wettest part of the country because uh, that area get uh, so much rain than the other side so that area is called a uh, wet zone so uh, in the most of, majority of the area in the northern and uh, eastern side is called dry zone because that area gets uh, much less rainfall than uh, the other area so in between there's a, a area called intermediate zone so that get an intermediate amount of rainfall another thing is uh, the, the time of the year of having the rain is different in these areas in wet zone uh, you get mostly the rain in this this time of the year that is uh, from uh, may to uh, september from the uh, southwest monsoon and in the dry zone mostly they get rains in the uh, in december to uh, january or february so uh, depending uh, on the uh, monsoon uh, pattern uh, these areas get different type uh, dif uh, get rain in different times of the year the intermediate zone however get uh, rain from both these monsoons but in uh, in, in southwest monsoon uh, they are not getting ra much rain as the wet zone but uh, a portion of that uh, southwest monsoon also uh, received by the intermediate zone so uh, uh, the se second and third map you can see that the variation uh, of the rainfall pattern uh, within certain years uh, uh, the, se the map at the middle uh, provide the data for 1911 to, 1911 to 1940 and the other thing is uh, 1961 to 1990 you can see there is a certain change in uh, with the uh, rainfall amount you can see that uh, uh, northern border of the uh, green uh, layer is uh, reduced so the wet area is becoming much more less than the uh, less than in the early of the previous century so you can see that the rain is uh, becoming dif uh, becoming a uh, change so the differences uh, on the vegetation is not much uh, studied on be behalf of this uh, rainfall pattern so if the vegetation has been changed eventually the butterfly distribution is also has to be changed so that is a very dynamic thing and uh, we don't have uh, data to uh, analyze uh, those changes so uh, when we go to butterfly zones uh, these are the butterfly zones that we have identified uh, typically uh, wet zone uh, and intermediate zone dry zone northern zone and hill country so those are the uh, basic uh, uh, butterfly zones that we have identified up to now actually uh, recently uh, we uh, we uh, have uh, to uh, think that the intermediate zone uh, section has to be uh, split into two sections especially the eastern intermediate zone uh, we could have to uh, uh, consider as a uh, 
different butterfly zone than other intermediate areas. I mean, the northern part, this area, and this area uh, is uh, 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 one type, and this part is another uh, zone of uh, butterfly because this area has a much more uh, diverse uh, butterfly population than the northern intermediate zone and southern intermediate zone. There's a reason for that because the intermediate zone in uh, respect to the uh, rainfall, uh, they get a similar rainfall. But the thing is, uh, so in, from, uh, from the wet zone to dry zone, you can uh, see the gradual uh, differences of uh, microhabitats in this uh, intermediate zone. So in, in that intermediate zone, you can see uh, some wet zone butterflies as well as some dry zone butterflies. Sometimes uh, they, uh, the occupation uh, can be changed uh, by time to time. Uh, in the rainy day, rainy period, in intermediate zone, uh, wet zone species are much more common. But in the dry period, uh, dry zone species are much more common in intermediate zone. So uh, when we go to the eastern intermediate zone, apart from the rainfall uh, variation, you can see a lot of uh, elevation gradient. So uh, some hill country species also found uh, in this uh, eastern intermediate uh, zone. So that is the uh, best area for uh, butterflying in Sri Lanka. I mean, the the most of the most number of butterflies can be seen in that area, eastern intermediate zone, especially in uh, Nakals, uh, Nilgala, and those type of areas. Uh, in a uh, northern dry zone, uh, it is uh, that area is the uh, area that received the very much uh, less rainfall, so the butterflies are uh, adapted to that condition are uh, the other species that are living in that northern zone. So uh, the plants and the butterflies uh, are restricted to uh, restricted due to that uh, rainfall uh, pattern of Sri Lanka. So as a total, we have uh, 248 species of butterflies. Uh, among them, 31 of them are endemics. So uh, most of these endemic species are restricted to wet zone and hill country. So that's the uh, distribution pattern related with uh, plants in Sri Lanka. So uh, let's uh, now directly uh, move on to uh, uh, butterflies and plants. So this is the uh, life cycle of a typical butterfly that has four uh, stages in their life cycle. Actually, the egg and the pupa uh, is, a, we can say that's a dormant uh, stages because uh, they are not moving uh, uh, and uh, we can't see any uh, activities on these structures. So uh, we, uh, can't uh, see much of the uh, uh, movements and all those things. So uh, these can be considered as dormant stages, but inside those structures, a uh, lot of uh, changes has happened. But uh, usually we uh, see the two stages. Actually, the adult stage is the uh, mostly uh, uh, obvious uh, stage uh, for people. And there's a larval stage. In both these two stages, uh, butterflies uh, need food. So they take food, but for different purposes. Another thing is that uh, they have uh, they are they have developed their mouth parts for different type of foods. Mostly the butterflies depend on uh, plant material, but that material. Uh, is different in larval stage and adult stage. Actually, the in the larval stage, uh, their uh, mouth parts has developed to chew. 
So uh, they have a mouth like such as us. So uh, it, they can chew and uh, eat the eat hard material. But in the adult stage, their mouth part is developed to, into a tube that is called proboscis. So the tube is used to drink something. So in the adult stage, all the material that are uh, taken as food by butterflies are should be in liquid form. So uh, even uh, in even uh, these butterflies, you uh, use uh, the plant material in both in the larval stage and adult stage. They have uh, split split up the uh, using of the resources by uh, adapting to different type of uh, foods in their uh, different stages of the life. Another thing is uh, the requirement of uh, the food is quite different in these two stages. In the larval stage, uh, mostly uh, they need protein because they need to grow up. Uh, so uh, in the larval stage, uh, they molt for about uh, six times and uh, grow bigger and bigger and they uh, collect all the energy and all the other resources we care to develop an adult butterfly. Because uh, when the uh, adult butterfly emerge from the pupa, they never grow up again. So uh, all the uh, proteins that required to uh, grow up grow the adult stage is gathered in the larval stage. So uh, the larval stage food is mostly uh, consist of high protein uh, material. But in the adult stage, uh, they uh, need food only to uh, get energy to uh, do their day-to-day -day activities. So the energy is taken by carbohydrate. So they need sugary things to eat uh, in their adult stage. So, uh, so mostly they uh, go for uh, nectar, but not only nectar, we can discuss other things as well, related to plants. Uh, and also the adult butterfly uh, take uh, uh, material other than plants as their adult stage uh, feeding material. We are not going to uh, discuss them de in detail here, but if you have questions, uh, you we can discuss at the later. So uh, there's a special thing on uh, plants of their larval stage because uh, uh, butterfly larvae not are not eating any of the plant that they can eat. So they have certain selected species of plants and they eat only those plant species. It can be a leaf, it can be a flower, it can be a fruit, anything, but uh, they are restricted to certain uh, type of uh, plants uh, in their uh, larval stage uh, to depend on. So uh, here are some uh, common uh, uh, larval food plants. The first thing is uh, Arica coccina. That's a palm tree. Usually the palm flies and uh, palm seeds, they use uh, these trees, uh, many palm trees. And uh, one thing is, uh, other thing is uh, Orisa sativa. Uh, so people are cultivated uh, in uh, this uh, Orisa sativa for food in uh, vast quantities. So that's a good uh, uh, material for certain skippers and Saturday day butterflies. So actually, some uh, butterflies can be uh, act as pests on uh, this uh, orisa. And uh, there is a butterfly called uh, Nilgiriti that a butterfly you, you always feed on orchid species. This is a Vanda tessellata. The dry zone uh, orchid of Sri Lanka. So uh, you can see the white uh, roots on that 
plan so that's the part that the that the nilgiri is eating uh, and of, of course they are eating the flowers as well and uh, the ficus religiosa uh, that's another uh, quite interesting plant all the ficus species uh, because uh, uh, some butterflies uh, used to eat the leaves and some but other some other butterflies used to eat the fig so in the same tree they eat different parts so they have minimized the competition for their food so the uh, common crow is usually eating leaves of this uh, ficus plants but uh, if we uh, take uh, silver streak blue that uh, tiny butterfly usually feed on figs of this uh, ficus trees and uh, uh, the last one at the first row is uh, anona muricata that's a exotic plant actually uh, but uh, you can see if there are uh, anona trees in home gardens uh, you can always see tail j around it because tail j want to lay eggs on this plant so uh, even the even on the exotic plants uh, native butterfly species has adapted to feed dog and uh, we have uh, other native uh, plants as uh, larval food plants of certain butterflies but uh, some of them has adapted to exotic species as well so uh, in uh, certain butterflies has been uh, population of certain butterflies has been increased due to uh, cultivated uh, plants in certain areas and uh, the flower on the bottom row is uh, calcropis gigantea uh, that's a uh, quite interesting plant i'll explain the, the, the thing later this plant is uh, uh, used by a uh, plain tiger uh, so this plant is a dry zone species very rarely you can see it in wet zone so as like uh, since the plant is found in dry zone the plain but a plain tiger is also abundant in dry zone especially near the beaches so that's the habitat of this plant so the butterfly is also very much common in that habitat and uh, other thing is uh, the last uh, photograph is uh, uh, velang that is a uh, pterocarpus subifolium that's a quite uh, common uh, tree in a uh, secondary forest of dry zone so this plant uh, is used by uh, several uh, hesperid species such as uh, golden angle uh, sri lanka pipe flat so they are quite abundant in that area so uh, likewise there are uh, so many butterfly larval food plants uh, so at the moment we have recorded nearly uh, 500 species of plants uh, of uh, butterflies that are using as larval food plants among these plants except for uh, cycas species uh, there are uh, one cycas uh, species native species we have found and uh, about uh, two to three exotic species uh, that cycas species are feed uh, are fed by uh, plain scubid other than that all the other larval food plants are flowering plants so that's the importance of the flowering plants with uh, butterflies so uh, when we take uh, considering about the egg laying here you can see all the butterflies are try are trying to uh, conceal their eggs uh, as much as possible because after the butterfly lay the eggs uh, they are not protecting it further so uh, the eggs has to survive itself so the uh, adult female butterfly always trying to lay the egg at a concealed place 
So in this uh, carbonate spinosa, you can see there's a small uh, uh, pit like thing at top of the fruit. Actually, this uh, comes from a uh, uh, inferior ovary because uh, the ovary uh, is uh, uh, within the uh, calyx tube. So in that type of flowers, you can see this type of uh, fruit uh, as in guava. So uh, there's a hollow in the top of the fruit. So uh, this guava blue always trying to lay the egg at this hollow because uh, it can well conceal. Here also the same, the pea blue is always trying to uh, lay the egg uh, among the flower buds. So uh, predators can't see them. So that's how uh, they are usually uh, laying eggs. You can see uh, they uh, bend the abdomen halfway and uh, put the egg. Actually, uh, they are not just uh, putting it uh, with the egg. They have a glue so they can attach the egg to the uh, plant surface. So uh, we'll discuss about some uh, interesting uh, relationships of uh, butterflies and plants. And then again, you can see a ant here. This is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, this plant, Humboldtia lorifolia, uh, it's a uh, uh, sublayer uh, plant in the lowland wet zone rainforest. It is a uh, Fabaceae species, and uh, it has a quite interesting uh, stem because uh, its young stem has a hollow. So. You, you can see it as a stick, but if you cut it off, you can see a hollow inside. And uh, if you look it at uh, more detail, you can see there are so many ants in that hollow. So the plant here uh, provide a home for certain type of ants. So, uh, can you think of what would be the benefit that the plant get from uh, those these ants? Because the this plant make a special structure to use as a home for ants. Because the thing is that plant expect uh, that uh, other insects will not come to uh, the leaves to eat the, those leaves. Since the ants are there, because usually ant, ants are biting everyone. So if the ant, ants on the tree, uh, other insects, uh, leaf hoppers and, and butterfly larvae and all those things are reluctant to come to these plants. So that's the benefit uh, that uh, the plant is expecting from these ants by providing the uh, home. And in the uh, larval stage, uh, not in the uh, actually at in, at in, in the flushing uh, season, flush is the most uh, delicate part of the leaf, delicate uh, period of the leaf. So most of the attacks are uh, happen to those flush. So uh, in this uh, Humboldtia, they have developed some glands in this uh, young flush to attract the ants in that hollow to come to the uh, flush. You can see here, these are the glands. These are the glands. These glands emit uh, juicy sap. So the ants in that uh, hollow comes to the uh, flush when they are flushing because the flush provide a uh, juicy sap for uh, the ant. So the, when the ants are there, plant is expecting that uh, it, the flush is not eaten by any other creature. So even though that is the ex expectation of the plant, this butterfly has evolved to uh, eat this uh, 
plan because uh, uh, this is a Sri Lanka sirling is an endemic uh, butterfly species so it is also uh, restricted to uh, the wet uh, forested areas because this tree uh, is growing in that this area and special thing is that i have observed that even uh, uh, if this tree is found in sunny habitat even the plant is there uh, the butterfly cannot be seen because the trees in, uh, the plants in the sunny habitats uh, ants are not there so the butterfly here need the plant as well as the ant so that's uh, this is how it goes uh, actually uh, the plant is giving a, a juicy sap to the ant no here the butterfly larvae is also giving a juicy sap to the ant so uh, other than uh, irrespective of uh, biting the uh, butterfly larvae uh, ants tend to protect the butterfly larvae because and ants get a benefit from butterfly larvae so uh, without uh, getting any harmful thing from the ants harmful bite from the ants uh, butterfly larvae can eat the flesh so that's how uh, this butterfly survives in the uh, larval stage so this is the only larval food plant of this butterfly so it has uh, been developed to uh, as a very interesting way to uh, utilize this plant irrespective of the protective mechanism that is uh, taken by the plant this is another such plant uh, locally uh, we call kukulkatu uh, that is that means a uh, spur of uh, jungle fowl you can see the dried uh, thorns, they are very much like the spur of the jungle fowl. So this is a Vachelia abernia. Actually, until recently, this plant is called uh, Acacia abernia. Now uh, it has moved to a different genus. Uh, this is a, a very good plant, larval, good, larval food plant for uh, several uh, silver line species. Uh, common short silver line, uh, then uh, common silver line, like those. Because uh, there's a ant, like in the previous uh, plant, uh, this ant has been identified as the belongs to the genus of Crematogaster. They are very uh, active and uh, very. Uh, they are very uh, much uh, biting uh, others. So plant expect lots, so much protection from these ants from against other insects. But uh, the thing is that this uh, cellulose larvae has evolved to uh, live with these uh, crematogaster ants. So you can see that this stone is a much big thing. So there's a hollow in the uh, base of the uh, thorn. Actually, uh, still I couldn't find uh, uh, who is the uh, hollow maker because uh, in, because uh, ant has to go inside with, with a small hollow. So I think uh, it has been uh, cut by uh, ants themselves in the early stages of the thorn. And uh, the butterfly larvae usually lives within this uh, thorn in the daytime. So uh, the, this is the typically this is the uh, house of the primatogast ants, but uh, the butterfly larvae also living within this. So uh, in the night they come out and eat the leaves. So that's how it goes on. Uh, the the way that the butterfly uh, lives with uh, ant is that the same thing as the previous one. The butterfly larvae gives a sugary uh, liquid to the ant. So 
the ants are not uh, biting the butterfly larva. So that's how that relationship is going on. And also, uh, this uh, plant is uh, behaves as a very good uh, nectar plant for uh, adult butterflies as well. So uh, during the uh, uh, flowering season, you can see so many uh, cilia lines around these plants because both the adults and uh, larva are feed on, feed on this plant. Uh, this is a butterfly that is not eating leaves. Actually, you can see that uh, this uh, butterfly larvae is usually eating uh, fruits. So, uh, in this picture, you can see that uh, the larvae dig into the fruit and then uh, the larvae lives within that uh, fruit. So, since there is a very hardy cover around it, uh, the larvae get a much more protection than other butterfly larvae because uh, the attacks are minimal. And uh, here you can see, actually, uh, this is the head, this is the tail. Most of the uh, uh, Lysinid butterflies are like this. Uh, the front side and back side are not much different. But uh, if you look at uh, carefully uh, in this larvae, you can see in the last segment, has developed to a shield. So this butterfly uh, larvae is going going to the uh, uh, fruit, and there is a hollow here now. So within within the uh, fruit, they the larvae always keep its uh, shield in this point. So. This uh, opening is also closed when the butterfly larvae is uh, inside this tube. So uh, it conceals all the openings and uh, enjoys the full uh, protection from predators. And uh, within that, uh, but the larvae used to eat the material uh, of the fruit. Uh, this is a Cartonagon spinosa. Uh, actually, this same butterfly is also eating uh, wood apple. It is a very hardy uh, shell, but they can chew it up and go inside. So uh, that's how uh, they get the protection from uh, other predators while feeding, uh, while having feeding material. But uh, there's an issue uh, comes up. Uh, while the larvae is uh, eating this fruit. As you know, uh, the pl a plant is uh, making a fruit uh, is to uh, propagate their, uh, uh, germinate their uh, uh, next generation by developing seeds. But here, the larvae goes inside and eating those seeds. So uh, there is a problem for the tree. So uh, the tree is getting to know there is something odd is happening within this fruit. And uh, the tree is getting to know that uh, the seeds will not be developed within this fruit. So the tree is uh, trying to uh, discard uh, this fruit because uh, the tree doesn't want to waste its energy because all the development has been done by using uh, soil fertilizer, then water, then they have the photosynthesis, and all those uh, energy has been used to develop the fruit. But uh, the, the, this fruit, the plant, doesn't get the purpose of the fruit. So plant is decided is deciding to uh, remove the uh, fruit from the tree. But the thing is that 
butterfly larvae also know uh, the plant is going to do this thing. So uh, usually uh, after eating uh, it, in a few days, uh, the larvae comes out again. And the thing is that uh, the butterfly larvae bind the uh, fruit to uh, the tree uh, by its, uh, there's a special uh, thing that uh, special gland that butterfly larvae can use as a, uh, use uh, to make uh, view uh, threads. So from these threads, the, the butterfly larvae attach the fruit to the tree. So you can see in the last picture, the tree has removed the fruit from its uh, pedicel, but the fruit is remaining at the tree because due to this uh, uh, larvae uh, binding. So butterfly larvae can uh, retain on the tree without falling down. So that's how it get that protection. And uh, I think you have heard of uh, butterfly migration. That is also uh, a, re a reason of uh, the seasonality of uh, plant uh, phenology. Actually, the butterfly migration is uh, starts from dry zone and spread throughout the country. Because uh, dry zone has a very distinct uh, seasonal differences. During the uh, uh, August and September, the dry zone get very much dry. So most of the plant plants get dried up and uh, butterfly population also uh, reduced to a great extent. Uh, in uh, late October or early November, dry zone receives some rains. That, that is an uh, inter-monsoon rain. Locally, we call it as uh, Thora Vassar because uh, from, from that rain, many of the uh, Thora species, that is, uh, Sena species, are uh, flushing, are going to be flushing. So, in that flush, uh, the uh, remaining uh, butterflies, especially the Catopsilia species, that means uh, lemon emigrant mot and mottle emigrant, and uh, many of the grass yellows as well. Uh, in that flush, those, those butterfly species uh, are laying eggs. So uh, in the harsh conditions, very few butterflies have survived, but they, uh, they are laying thousands of egg, eggs because uh, they have to uh, come up, uh, they, they have to uh, uh, reinstate that they are regular population. So, so many uh, eggs has been laced by that few number of butterflies. So uh, in that rain, uh, the flush is coming. So the butterflies are laying eggs. And you can see uh, in uh, uh, Sena species like this, uh, Sena auriculata, there are so many uh, butterfly larvae are uh, uh, feeding on leaves of them. So. Uh, from this larvae, a lot of uh, adult butterflies are emerged, and the amount of butterflies for that area is uh, going to be much more uh, higher than their uh, capacity. So the adult butterflies are trying to search new uh, areas for living. So they spread all over the country. So that's how. The butterfly migration starts. So uh, from the from this uh, inter monsoon rain, uh, from this Thoravas, mostly the emigrants uh, take part in migration because most of the uh, Sena species are going to be flushed due to, from due to this uh, inter monsoon rain. So uh, this is the this is one uh, migration, but uh, there is another migration in February. So that is uh, represented by another type of uh, butterflies. 
So this uh, uh, migration uh, uh, mainly consists of uh, albert albatross species, uh, lesser, Al Sri Lanka lesser albatross, and common albatross sometimes uh, joins the chocolate albatross as well. Because the thing is that uh, the larval feed plants of this albatross is a dry petis sepiara. So unlike that Sena species, a dry petis is a big tree. So the, the dry petis uh, uh, need much more rain than the intermediate so interme uh, intermonsoon rains to have flush. So uh, dry petis seed trees ha has to wait until the monsoon rains to have the have their flushing. So in uh, late November and December, uh, monsoon rain comes, and at that time, these uh, butterflies uh, are laying eggs on this flush. So from that larvae, uh, usually they uh, come out as uh, adult butterflies in uh, late uh, January and February. So in that period, again, this group of butterflies start an migration. So uh, these are the main two migrations in Sri Lanka. Other butterflies also will join them, but majority consists of these uh, Albert crosses in February and uh, migrants in uh, November. So that's how it goes. And uh, this is a quite uh, special uh, butterfly. Because uh, this butterfly uh, lays egg, eggs in, in the, in the uh, trees, but they, they never eat uh, material of that tree because they are laying eggs on, the, on completely dead trees. So there's nothing, any uh, nourishment to feed on. Uh, so at the moment we still don't know what the exact thing, but we hope that in uh, within these uh, dead trees there is a certain type of ants living. So uh, we think perhaps these butterfly larvae are eating the grubs of these ants. This is a very much uh, rare butterfly found in the mountain zone of the Sri Lanka. Perhaps actually there's a, a phenomenon called uh, forest dieback. That means uh, the forest of, of the, forest of the uh, uh, hilltops are uh, becoming uh, died. So uh, actually, that uh, forest dieback seems to be a uh, good thing for this butterfly. Even though the trees are dying, uh, the butterfly larvae gets places to lay the eggs. And uh, this is a, another butterfly that is not eating uh, plant material, this ape fly. You can see uh, this is the ape fly larvae. Actually, it's a uh, uh, whitish brown uh, larvae, but you can see in the top, it is completely white because uh, uh, it itself uh, put, it, put, put the uh, uh, dust of this mealy bug on it because uh, this. Uh, Butterfly larvae eats mealybugs. So if it uh, puts that uh, resemble a mealybug, the larvae can uh, 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 the the larvae can eat the mealybug without knowing them. So that's why they are putting this uh, white uh, dust powder on uh, itself. Uh, then they can uh, eat the uh, mealybugs. Another thing is you can see the ants as well. So there's a relationship with mealybugs and ants. So uh, eventually uh, the relationship again comes with those different types of animals here. And uh, the, uh, some, uh, some of these uh, protective mechanisms used by uh, butterflies are, are pro uh, displayed here. You can see that uh, in the first picture, you can see a, a butterfly egg here. 
Actually, uh, the, this egg is of uh, common ceruleans, but I have marked here as dark cerulean. If you look at very carefully, there are two types of eggs. The, actually, this is the common cerulean sex egg, and if you look at carefully, this is the place that the dark cerulean sex has deposited. Actually, the dark cerulean sex is uh, very much uh, brightly blue colored, very much easily seen, but this uh, this butterfly lay the egg and then put uh, uh, some material on it uh, to cover that egg. That material is very much uh, resembling the uh, uh, hairs of this plant. So that's how it protects the egg. And uh, when we go to uh, Baran and Godi Baran, you can see uh, there are spine-like th things on the egg. Actually, end of that spine, there is a uh, drop of gum. So the butterfly expect uh, to uh, protect the egg from uh, parasitoids. Parasitoids are the ones that Arms and lays eggs on these eggs. They, the, those parasitoids lays eggs on these butterfly eggs, and the butterfly eggs are eaten by uh, these parasitoids. So they are very much tiny. Actually, the the whole uh, uh, the whole egg is about uh, two millimeters in diameter. The the parasitoid is even much more smaller than that. If you look at carefully, you can see uh, a parasitoid has attached to this uh, area. So it has come to lay the egg, but uh, it failed uh, because due to the uh, protective me mechanism of the uh, butterfly larvae. So there's a special thing that uh, the Godi Baron usually uh, uh, lays eggs on very much uh, mature leaves. Most of the butterflies uh, like to eat uh, immature leaves, but this one lays egg on, eggs on mature leaves. There's a reason behind that. Uh, because uh, uh, if you see uh, this patch, this patch is very much similar in color as well as in similar size to this egg. So if you uh, look at it from a, a distance, you can't identify the egg. Uh, actually, uh, uh, it happens like this. Uh, there are certain insects that are eating the upper surface of this leaf. So uh, when they eat that, uh, you can see uh, this patch. This is a newly eaten patch. It is quite green colored, but uh, yeah, it becomes uh, reddish by its sap about in a day. So after that patches has come, only this, this adult Godi Baron is, is uh, coming and laying its eggs. Otherwise, even the plant is there, it is not laying the eggs. It has to be fully matured and develop this type of uh, patches in the leaves. Another thing is that um, certain butterfly larvae uh, mimics, uh, resembles the uh, hair types of uh, certain plants. You can see uh, there are certain way, very much uh, varied types of hair types on plants. Uh, this is a, a glandular one, and this is a, a tomentos that, that is like a, a hair like thing. This type of uh, uh, hairs are developed even by the butterfly larvae so they can conceal within them. So uh, this is one thing. You can see many of the uh, pyridae uh, butterflies, they are developing this uh, glandular hairs. Uh, this is the same thing uh, is going to happen uh, with uh, the eggs that I have explained before. The parasitoids are getting attached to uh, this uh, Thumbs. Another thing is that uh, they can camouflage in this white royal. 
actually uh, if you look at this uh, picture axillus tomentosus tomentosus picture there are four larvae of this this type in this uh, picture i think uh, no one can find them i can show you one uh, larvae it is uh, here here yeah. so uh, they can uh, very very easily camouflage by uh, getting that uh, uh, hair type by uh, in, on their uh, body so uh, actually as as a good uh, butterfly observer you have to uh, be aware of the feeding pattern of butterfly larvae actually if you have experience enough if you have this uh, feeding pattern on the leaf you you know that there are butterfly larvae so most most of the butterfly larvae have uh, the uh, very distinct feeding pet feeding patterns uh, they make feeding uh, they make distinct uh, feeding patterns on the leaves so you can identify uh, there are uh, larvae on those uh, plants and uh, this is another thing uh, that is uh, used by uh, butterfly larvae to uh, protect uh, using the plants uh, especially the, this is uh, done by uh, the butterflies in the hesperidae family they make houses from using these uh, uh, leaves actually uh, the golden angle is on uh, berria cordifolia halmilla then uh, the philippine swift uh, it is on uh, it is on uh, australia stridula uh, butter uh, then this all king that is on uh, meliosma uh, pinata and this giant red dye it is on uh, heing way well that is uh, calamus rotan so each and every species have different uh, plants as well as different uh, types of house so if you know the plant and type of the house you no need not to open it up and see what is the uh, larvae you can uh, tell what is the larvae by uh, looking at the plant as well as the shape of this house so uh, each and every uh, hesperid larvae have uh, this type of houses for their protection and uh, other thing is that uh, most of the uh, larvae technique uh, used by butterfly larvae to protect is uh, to camouflage you can see that certain uh, plants get flush in green certain get flush in uh, red and some others in white so the butterfly larvae feed on those uh, specific plants are uh, in that uh, specific colors so they can uh, conceal very well uh, within those uh, leaves so this is another interesting thing uh, you can see there are two larvae and one pupa all these are of uh, one species of butterfly but you can see that when uh, the monkey pasil larvae feed on uh, Exora coccinna, the larvae is red colored, but uh, when it feeds on leaves of uh, Gymnosporia, it looks green because uh, those colors uh, helps it to conceal among the material that is that it is feeding on. And uh, these two are quite uh, different. Uh, from odd odd creatures from other butterflies because uh, these are feeding on uh, very uh, mature leaves they are very hard but they have to use these uh, mature leaves because uh, their protective mechanism is uh, related to these mature leaves so uh, this is, uh, first one is a uh, uh, baronet and diaspirus melanoxylon the interesting thing is that this uh, diaspirus melanoxylon kudumbaria that this plant is growing only at uh, savanna habitats of the 
eastern intermediate zone so this butterfly is also restricted to that area so uh, that's how the relationship goes on the thing is that uh, the savanna habitats uh, are usually uh, originates uh, due to uh, seasonal firing so initially we thought that the firing is a threat for this butterfly because in the firing has is go going to happen in the driest months of the uh, year so in that stay that period the adult stage butterflies are very much rare so if they are there most of them are should be in a uh, pupal stage but uh, the thing is that we get to know that uh, the fire needs this tree because uh, when the uh, the savanna is get fired uh, in the next season there are sprouts coming up uh, from the roots of these uh, uh, this, uh, dried uh, savanna habitat so that's how this uh, plant uh, is uh, propagating so uh, i don't know how the butterfly uh, survive in the fire because one thing could be that the whole area is not uh, getting fired at once so the butterflies from other areas can come to new land so that could be a possibility so anyway uh, the actually the firing has benefited this butterfly uh, because uh, the larval fruit plant is uh, become uh, more and more uh, uh, common due to these fires so this is a uh, very common uh, thing that in that area uh, people pluck the leaves of this uh, tree for local cigarettes uh, so the people uh, name this uh, larvae as guinea pan actually there is other uh, moth larvae which is very much similar to this one as well so both of them are calling as guinea pan by local people so interesting is thing is that you can see that uh, you can uh, see the the dorsal line of the butterfly larvae is uh, much more lighter so it is uh, very much uh, uh, similar to this midrib so uh, when the butterfly uh, larvae is uh, at uh, in rest it always uh, stays like this it's always uh, staying along the midrib so the color of the larvae merge with the uh, leaf of the plant you can see that uh, the lamina area is much more darker this area is quite lighter so this color difference comes at the uh, uh, mature leaves but not in the immature leaves so that's why the larvae uh, used to uh, use this uh, mature leaves so uh, in the next picture uh, this is the godi baran larvae you can see that uh, actually uh, i was there i was there for about uh, half an hour without seeing this uh, larvae uh, it was about just 2 uh, feet away from me it is very well camouflaged because its color pattern very well matches with the uh fungus and uh, moss growth in this leaf so in the in this rainforest uh, plants uh it will take some uh, time to grow these uh, fungi and mosses so the only the mature leaves have this type of uh, uh things on the leaves so this butterfly larvae also using this uh, mature leaves to uh, feed on because uh, its protective mechanism is uh, related to mature leaves of the uh, larval food plant but the thing is that uh, even though uh, the butterflies uh, get so many uh, precautions uh, there are so many parasitoids they lay eggs on butterfly larvae you can see in the first picture uh, there is a fly uh, you can see this uh, special structure 
we call it as a uh, ovipositor actually butterflies also have this structure from this ovipositor uh, they can place uh, the egg to the uh, correct position so this uh, likewise uh, this uh, other insects lay eggs on these uh, butterfly larvae so from that egg the parasitoid uh, larvae comes out and then it uh, dig into the uh, la butterfly larvae's body and start to eat the butterfly larvae while it is living the butterfly larvae is uh, usually feeds on leaves while it is feeding the parasitoid larvae is the butterfly larvae within it so you can see in, in the inside this uh, uh, body there are parasitoid larvae so uh, when the uh, parasitoid larvae is fully matured they uh, pupates mostly they uh, comes out of the butterfly larvae but in species such as uh, in uh, danoid species they pupate inside the butterfly larvae so afterwards the butterfly larvae is die and eventually the parasitoid uh, adults are comes out from this pupate and other thing is there are so many predators this is one of that uh, jumping spiders these jumping spiders are not making webs they always hide among flowers to uh, catch the uh, fellows that are coming to feed on flowers so uh, there are you can see there are so many uh, butterflies sometimes attached to flowers but if you have a closer look you can see that the jumping spider has uh, caught up that fellow so uh, that's the things about uh, larva to plants and uh, this plant group is a quite interesting uh, plant group regarding the uh, pla larval fruit plants apocynaceae we call uh, milk peats because uh, it has milky sap this milky sap is uh, quite poisonous so uh, the the certain type of uh, certain species of butterflies has developed to eat this uh, leaves of the plants in their larval stage and they can store that poisonous poisonous material in their body until the adult stage so they since they are poisonous usually the birds are not eating these butterflies so that's the technique uh, that butterflies are using uh, to protect uh, in the adult stage as well so uh, actually these are poisonous butterflies all these tigers are uh, poisonous butterflies because they are feed on milk weeds so they mimic each other because uh, it is very much easy to to birds to uh, remember whether they are poisonous by looking at this uh, unique color pattern if they see this type of a butterfly they know that this is a poisonous butterfly and they are not going to eat that butterfly so uh, that's a certain type of mimicry but you can see that there's another one called mine it looks very much like these tigers but the thing is that it is not actually poisonous so even though this mine is po not poisonous they mimic uh, the tigers to get that false protection so uh, this is some uh, milk weed flowers of sri lanka you can see uh, that uh, even though uh, butterfly larvae eat uh, the leaves of uh, those plants the apocynaceae plant doesn't get any benefit uh, from uh, butterflies because uh, the butterflies cannot pollinate these flowers you can see that this apocynaceae species especially ascapidaceae you, you can see it to the outside there is a star like thing at the middle this is uh, oxystelma 
uh, this is a uh, mesotoxicum actually until recently this is this was called uh, tylophora now all has uh, put into mesotoxicum this is a uh, hemidesmus eremosum this is pentatrophis again this is a uh, mesotoxicum uh, fasciculatum this is a uh, hoya pauciflora gonuca and uh, this is a uh, Regular yadami, all the flowers have has this star-like structure. This is very hardy thing. Uh, this is uh, the uh, combined structure developed by uh, stamens as well as histi. So uh, the butterflies cannot pollinate this structure. Uh, I don't know who are the pollinators. I have seen that uh, the carpenter bee is uh, usually visiting. Uh, uh, Calcropis gigantea, that is Vara. So, that type of very uh, hardy uh, insects would have uh, pollinated these flowers. So, uh, these Apocynaceae plants usually uh, not getting any benefit from butterflies other than the, uh, the harassment by uh, eating the leaves. And uh, there's another uh, special thing. Uh, in uh, these uh, tigers and crows, uh, apart from the larval shoot plants, they attracted to certain uh, type of plants uh, that provided uh, some uh, material called danoid. Actually, all these butterflies are males. In the adult stage, all the males attracted to these plants because they uh, get sap from these plants and from this sap they make a scent so uh, if you see that uh, if you see uh, that structure here this is a sex uh, sex brand so uh, the butterflies can uh, spread the scent to attract females uh, to uh, by uh, providing that scent so that's how the butterflies attract females so all the males come to these type of plants especially heliotropium and clotaria i have seen uh, some strobilanthus species for the uh, sri lanka tiger so they come to uh, these plants especially when they are dying the plants are dying they have come to these plants and get the sap and make the uh, scent from that scent, they attract uh, female butterflies. So these are the sex brands of butterflies. You can see that uh, uh, various uh, species have different shapes and uh, different place, places of sex brand. So you can use this uh, position and shape of the sex brand to identify the usually the mimicking species. So in the adult stage, uh, unlike that uh, in the larval stage flowers, uh, larval stage uh, plants, they uh, in adult butterfly doesn't have any uh, restrictions in selection selecting of the plants. But they have preferences. Here you can see that uh, the flower heads contain so many flowers, so many tiny flowers. So uh, that is the type most of the butterflies prefer to feed on, especially the Asteraceae flowers. Many small butterflies come to feed on because they have very small flowers in a single head. So that's a uh, that's a one type of uh, flowers that uh, butterflies used to feed on. And here, this this is a special adaptations. You can see that in both these uh, butterflies especially actually in many of the hesperid butterflies they have very long proboscis so uh, they can put their proboscis into into very deep areas of the flower so in that flowers uh, they can take uh, nectar so these butterflies, these butterflies are specially attracted to these flowers because they know the nectar is reserved for them because others can't get that nectar. 
So these hesperic butterflies usually attracted to these uh, long uh, tubed uh, flowers. You can see that in the grass uh, demon. So it, uh, it, uh, getting nectar from here and uh, the flower provides a stand here by uh, having a petal here. So a butterfly can uh, perch on it and get the nectar from here. And you can see the its proboscis is uh, touching on the stamen, on the anthers. So the pollen get attached to this uh, proboscis. So that's how uh, plant is developed to uh, uh, pollinate its flowers. In the second picture, you can see that um, there's a small bulging here. Actually, this is the place that the anthers and uh, ovary is uh, situated. So, uh, if the butterfly has to get, uh, if, the, if, if the plant want to uh, uh, get attached uh, pollen on this butterfly's uh, proboscis, the proboscis has to go beyond that point. So usually the nectar glands are here. So butterfly uh, puts its proboscis up to this point. In the midway, it can uh, touch the uh, anthers. So that's how this uh, Taba Montana pl plant get uh, pollinated. And uh, this uh, Musenda species, it uh, use a very special technique uh, because uh, the flowers of the musanda plant is much more small. These musanda species are attracted by so many papillonid butterflies. They are very big butterflies. So uh, they uh, are very, quite fast butterflies. So uh, since the uh, flowers are very much small, they have developed another structure. Actually, this is a bract. They have uh, developed a very large bract to indicate that there is a flower here. So the butterflies know if uh, when they, they they see the this large bract, they know there are flowers and they come to feed on it. So that's how uh, they attract uh, butterflies. And uh, as you know that uh, this is a uh, Iliocarpus species, we have about uh, seven to eight Iliocarpus species. We have about uh, seven to eight Iliocarpus species. All of them, are, uh, all of the flowers are oriented downwards. So there are very few butterflies that can uh, uh, perch on upside down. Another thing is that uh, all these flowers has a very bad odor. Himesha, so, yeah. Uh, okay. Himesha, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I can't. We can't see your screen. Uh, 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 is there any problem sharing the screen? Can I take it? Uh, I think can 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 the others can see the screen? I think better to uh, share okay. it again. Is it the last slide? No, no. Okay, so better to share it again. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So you have to put the, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. How much time that I have? Uh, it's already uh, one and a half hour is gone. <laughs> you can have okay. uh, you can have some more time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, so they the iliocarpus flowers uh, are oriented upside down and they have bad odor. So mostly the iliocarpus flowers are targeting for uh, some uh, flies, not for many butterflies. But there are certain butterflies, especially the butterflies in the Hesperidae family, called uh, uh, flats, uh, uh, snow flats, then uh, pied flats. So they can uh, perch upside down. So that type of butterflies 
attracted to these flowers. And uh, this is a Cicigem, these are Cicigem species, that is the group that I am working now. So you can see that this plant, this group of plants are not developed for butterflies. There's a reason for that. Because uh, the, in Sri Lanka, most of the Cicigem species are the dominant species in the mountain peaks. So in that condition, uh, they have very uh, fast winds. So many of the butterflies cannot withstand the wind. So there is no use of uh, targeting butterflies uh, for the pollination. So since these uh, Cicigem species has evolved another type, another uh, 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 different things to attract different type of pollinators. Actually, uh, these uh, Cicigem species attracted attract uh, usually bees. So uh, unlike the butterflies, uh, bees uh, need nectar as well as pollen. So you can see that uh, these uh, Cicigium flowers have so many stamens. So there are so many pollens. So uh, the, the, these trees provide, provide some uh, pollen as food for but bees as well as the remaining thing they use for pollination. So that's how uh, they attract uh, uh, bees by providing both the nectar as well as uh, pollen. If you see this structure, uh, there's a, a cup-like thing in the middle. Actually, this cup is uh, usually filled with uh, nectar. So there's a nectar in the middle and pollen on the outside. So there are a lot of resources for bees, so they are coming there. Another thing is that you can see uh, it doesn't have uh, any uh, petals because butterflies are the ones that need uh, colorful, colorful things to attract for uh, attract to flower. But bees doesn't need; uh, they need color, but not not like uh, the butterflies. So the Cicigem species provide some color in their uh, cup in the middle, but not uh, as a uh, very large uh, colored uh, petals because the uh, Cicigem species doesn't need petals because they are not targeting butterflies. So uh, this is another group of plants uh, that not attract butterflies. There are so many of them. These are some examples. Uh, Impartian species, uh, that is Kudal species. Actually, uh, these uh, plant species are uh, growing in a very uh, shady habitats. And, uh, and other thing is that uh, most of these, these, are, these are herbaceous species, they are growing in very rainy season. So since the season is rainy, and then since the uh, habitat is shady, there are no butterflies in that type of uh, habitat. So there is not uh, use of uh, targeting butterflies for these flowers. So they are targeting for very, uh, very much smaller uh, insects uh, like these things and uh, so they are providing resources for that insects to, for their pollination. If you see these uh, flowers, all the impartian species have a spur like thing. Yeah. All of them have a spur like thing. Actually, the nectar is uh, found here. There's a reason for that as well. Because uh, uh, these, flower, these are flowering in very rainy uh, seasons. If you have a cup like in the Cicigium, uh, they get easily uh, mixed up with uh, water and get diluted. So there's not use of that. So they have uh, concealed and protected the nectar and uh, in, in this uh, spur. So uh, the, butter, uh, the, the insect come to uh, get this ne nectar from this spur. And you can see that the insects come here 
and go inside like this. But you can see that the pollen is here, anthers are here. Then how it uh, get uh, transferred to insect? It is uh, uh, do, doing. Uh, it is doing in uh, such a way that when the uh, anthers are matured, the pollens fall into this uh, petal. So when the uh, insect is landed. It is uh, touched with uh, pollen is touched on uh, insect's body. That's how uh, they uh, develop for their pollination. Okay, the, then uh, other than the uh, flowers for adult butterflies, one other method of uh, taking uh, sugary things is from uh, fruits. Uh, the butterflies can't uh, dig into fru fruits because uh, their uh, proboscis is not not a hardy thing. So if uh, if it is fallen down or uh, eaten by another uh, squirrel or something, they can uh, come to those fruits and feed on uh, the juice of those fruits. Especially these uh, fruit eating butterflies are on in uh, Saturnian subfamily. That means uh, bush browns, tree, tree browns, and those things because they are adapted to that those things. Especially, actually, the bush browns are never feed on flowers. They always feed on these uh, overripened fruits because uh, uh, they they are not moved to a great distance. They are hiding in uh, very uh, dark uh, areas. That's why they get this brown color. So. With under the shade of trees, so they can have uh, food under the shade of uh, these trees as well. And uh, this is another thing that is uh, that is uh, feeding feeding by uh, butterflies. Certain saps are coming out from uh, trees, so they are feeding on those things, especially the southern dust. It is always uh, found among uh, Oshlandus vigula plants because its larval stage are depending on leaves of that plant. And here you can see that uh, the adult butterfly feed on the sap of that Oshlander plant. So uh, it is a highly localized species, uh, not coming out easily. And when usually uh, if they come out usually they are coming out in early in the morning or late in the evening so their entire life is uh, founding within this shady uh, habitat because uh, the the plant provide everything for them so uh, the things that i have mentioned here are a, a, a section of a part of the, the things that we have we are knowing that to up to that time so there are so many things and uh, there are so many other things that we are not knowing so it is it is better uh, as young guys uh, you better to study on these things especially the uh, ecology uh, between uh, butterflies or insects and plants the those uh, information information is very much rare in Sri Lanka, and uh, we don't know uh, what are the requirements for both the butterflies as well as plants. Uh, what are the requirements for their survival? The interactions, uh, the third party comes to uh, comes into play. All those things we don't know to, in, in, into a great extent. So there are a lot of things to do. On this uh, field, on this field. So uh, at last, uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, the distribution of butterflies in Sri Lanka, as well as other countries as well, mainly determined by the distribution of uh, plants. And uh, other thing is that uh, in this presentation, you, I think, you have uh, identified that both the butterflies and plants need. Uh, each other for their survival. Uh, mo most people think that uh, animals use plant, but in other way around, you can see that 
plants also using uh, animals. And uh, other thing is that uh, uh, some, some of these relationships are uh, not known to us. And other thing is that some of these uh, known relationships are very much uh, complex. So uh, we can't provide that type of relationships for their uh, survival. So best thing is to uh, conserve those habitats so that all the things are, all the things will be get conserved. So the uh, other than uh, species oriented conservation, I think uh, it is very much better to think of uh, habitat conservation. And uh, the finally, uh, the butterfly gardening that can be used as a uh, conservation method, especially uh, to uh, aware people. Actually, uh, as I said, very much uh, complex conditions we can't provide, and it is very, if it, it, it can be provided, it is very much costly. So, butterfly gardening should be mainly targeted for aware people to protect the uh, 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 natural habitats by uh, educating them. So, that's the things that I have uh, to tell to you. So thank you all. Uh, if any one of you have uh, questions, I can uh, answer now. Okay, thank you very much, Mishaya. It was really informative and very impressive presentation. Uh, and actually, the the knowledge he was sharing, uh, actually, uh, it is a result of uh, the studies of. Uh, years back so actually he was studying about the plants and all the butterflies in sri lanka so actually this is uh, his experiences uh, his knowledge so you can raise the questions now in the chat box uh, is there any questions you can ask now i think uh, there are lots of uh, i think uh, school children are uh, joining with us so somebody was asking, uh, what are endemics? What what do you mean by endemics? Uh, so you can tell them, Himeshaya, uh, okay. uh, regarding this. Yeah. In generally, endemic means uh, means restricted to a certain area. It could be a province, it could be a country, it could be a uh, habitat, it could be a, a region, likewise. So usually we are using the word endemic uh, in a usual term for uh, the butterfly species that are found only in Sri Lanka, only in Sri Lanka. That is the usual term, but you can use the endemic with those specificities. Uh, likewise, uh, it is endemic to uh, uh, South Asia, it is endemic to uh, Ampar, like Is it okay? Okay. Okay. So uh, actually, we also have some point endemic. So point endemic means that if if some uh, if the some species is endemic to Sri Lanka, and if the restrict uh, the distribution is restricted to a limited area, uh, even uh, in a pond, a single pond will be like uh, if a, if it is a fish, and it is uh, restricted to a, a single pond in. Sri Lanka somewhere else or some somewhere in the place also so which we call it point endemic so uh, so uh, one question is rising uh, February migration is that what uh, what we identify as migration towards end uh, Adam speak yeah actually the thing is that uh, the butterflies are going everywhere it starts from the dry zone and going everywhere uh, to the wet zone, to the hill hill country, and also to the sea. The but the thing is that uh, uh, they are going, uh, they are going along certain paths. Sometimes they use uh, roads. Sometimes they use rivers. So if they use mostly if they use uh, rivers, they are going along the river up to the hill. So that's how uh, we are uh, seeing that uh, usually they are. Some part of the butterflies directed to inland side, usually going to uh, highlands. So that's 
that's why we are calling the pilgrim Adam speak but not only Adam speak they are going they can they can be uh, go go everywhere okay uh, so uh, Himesha, i think you have mentioned about the heel topping uh, thing so heel topping uh, is a different phenomenon actually yeah. uh, that is uh, done by uh, some butterflies uh, that have very low population so usually you are not observing that they are going in a mass scale heel topping is a, a th activity done by uh, much uh, rare butterflies uh, to uh, find their mates. So uh, since the, they are very much less in number, it is uh, quite hard to find a female uh, for a male. So they, ha they have chosen a common place to meet up. So all of them uh, are climbing up a hill in a vast uh, flat land, so they can hit at that point. So that's hill topping. That's a different thing. And uh, you can't see uh, that uh, as a very uh, large mass uh, flying. But if you go to a hilltop, you can see uh, those uh, rare butterfly species. Uh, but you, if uh, but you can't see them in lowlands. So uh, actually, uh, even within the uh, small hill in the flat area, you can see that uh, they climb up to the hill. So if you are, if you are if you are in the top of the hill around eight or nine you can see those butterflies uh, in, uh, flying here and there but not as a very uh, large mass okay well uh, so actually uh, our secretary ruangika is mentioning about the painted lady migration uh, actually mm. uh, last year we got uh, the sightings uh, mainly in colombo area and some of the uh, each every corner from the island on uh, painted lady migration actually it was star uh, last year it was started in may the first sighting uh, from colombo is uh, uh, in may i think as i as I'm correct, and it was in Bere Lake. One of our member was uh, recorded, and then I uh, observed it in some of the wetlands in Colombo. So, uh, if anybody has seen the painted lady, lady again in this season, please inform us and uh, make an update in the Facebook. So, can you uh, can you talk about it, Himesha, about the migration of painted ladies? Actually, the Painted lady, uh, if we talking about the natural habitat of painted lady in Sri Lanka, the hill country, because the, the uh, larval food plants of the painted lady is growing in hill country. And uh, actually, the painted lady, uh, is, the Sri Lanka have uh, affinities from various areas uh, in butterflies in the world. So the painted lady has affinity to uh, Europe. So uh, it needs much cooler climate as well as food plant is growing in the hill country. So that is the typical area of uh, painted lady. But the thing is, uh, as you heard of a uh, monarch butterfly, painted lady is also a very uh, well-known uh, great uh, migrant. Uh, it uh, usually annually migrates from uh, Europe to Africa. So uh, that's the, the, the same species found in Sri Lanka. So uh, it has the ability to fly very uh, far, very longer distances in uh, peak time. So if there is a, a population boost off, uh, they can uh, be found anywhere. Sometimes uh, they can be coming from the mountains of Sri Lanka or perhaps Sometimes they are coming from uh, India as well because I have seen it even in uh, Mana. Is there any effect uh, of the monsoon wind uh, to this migration? Uh, the main uh, monsoon my, my, mon monsoon ma mainly uh, uh, depends on the butterfly migration of uh, Pyridae species. That means migrants, uh, Gracilos, uh, albatrosses, and all those things. Uh, other than that, other than that uh, species, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, there are no much uh, any uh, mass uh, migrations, but other species join them, 
during that my mass migration but not in uh, large quantities so uh, in the, the uh, painted ladies migration uh, there are, could be a, a, a effect on uh, rainfall pattern uh, but uh, we don't know uh, with the pinpoint okay uh, so there is another question uh, three is for grass yellow caterpillar is it mm -hmm. poisonous no no actually the mostly the poisonous butterflies can be found in the denine day subfamily that is crows and tigers those are the poisonous species uh, any questions any other questions Okay, I think no any questions. Uh, and okay, so uh, we have to tell you that uh, now it's like going to activate uh, as the monsoon is activated. Uh, so you can uh, have your butterfly gardens to get new plants. So the rain is coming. So get ready for the uh, get ready to provide the nectar for the uh, butterflies. So uh, you can start. I think most of you have uh, stayed at home during this lockdown. So you had enough time to prepare those things that arrange your garden in a well manner to nourish with butterflies and also with birds so we can um, we can give you advices and also we are very we are willing to give you uh, information and all the uh, instructions to have your butterfly garden in your home and um, and very few uh, news uh, that i want to give you uh, that actually we were planning to have a number of activities during this year uh, at the beginning of 2020 we had uh, a year plan but uh, during, uh, due to this lockdown we have uh, missed na lots of programs so uh, we were planning to have a dragonfly workshop two dragonfly workshops actually it is along with uh, the research which is done by uh, miller sumanapala uh, on mountain dragonflies so one was actually uh, missed uh, it was uh, scheduled to held in May, but now we we are go we can't held it because the season is past. Uh, we were planning to have it in Knuckles, but uh, most probably in August we are going to have uh, the Dragonfly fly workshop, the second one in uh, Singharaja, in Metsoon. So uh, there will be a selection process. Actually, we are going to screen uh, screen the per uh, participants. So we are having some application system and we will let you know uh, through social media and also by Gmail. Uh, please take, uh, take the membership so you will be updated frequently with our uh, emails. So be in touch. And also we are hoping to have the butterfly and dragonfly race. We will inform you the dates. Uh, we will hope for the best uh, without any further lockdowns. So uh, is there any thing you have to say in chat you can pass it now anything else okay so today uh, himesh uh, was talking about the micro factors microecological factors that butterflies needs to survive and these are very important as uh, as he is a conservationist we have uh, lots of knowledge he has lost lots, lots of knowledge we can share and uh, actually we don't know the uh, mic um, micro factors that uh, the butterfly needs to survive even in your garden if you have a natural uh, habitat uh, don't destroy it because uh, don't introduce exotic plants and uh, other things that uh, make uh, them as it is uh, leave them as it is but if you have a native pl a shrub or plants please leave them as it is because butterflies are attracted to the native plants so uh, thank you very much Shimeshaya, today's lecture and thank you you all uh, for the participation and we will be hoping to meet you soon uh, by another online lecture in next month thank you very much